Good Monday morning of Easter week. Uh, you know, I do these things weeks in advance. <laughs> right now, it's, I don't know what it is. On March 20, 23rd or 24th, I don't know what day it is. <laughs> it's raining, it's cold, it's miserable out. I just got in from taking Lily out. Anyway, today's, you know, it's interesting. This is the, in some ways, this is the life of the, this week is the week of the life of the early church. It's freely revelatory. You know, it's something special because in the Acts of the Apostles, you hear the preaching of Peter the head of the church, the rock upon which the church is built. And he proclaims the purity of the gospel. That is the truth. He is the quintessential leadership of the church. He's not eloquent. He's forthright. He tells, who is this Jesus who you, he's preaching to the Jews. This is the Jesus whom you crucified. Or you had crucified by lawless men. It doesn't mean the bad guys, it meant the Romans. Lawless means they didn't come under the Jewish law. Huh? So they were Romans. So between you and the Romans, the followers of Moses, who you should have recognized that Christ is the fulfillment of the Mosaic promise, and the Romans who conquered the world, see, that both should have recognized Christ and neither did they crucified him. And now the church has emerged out of the resurrection of Christ, his suffering, death, and resurrection, the Paschal mystery, and now she preaches a redemption to the world at the moment the familial world, that's the world of the Jews. That's the, who Peter is preaching to. But he'll eventually preach to the Romans in Rome. And it's cost him his life. You see? He'll be martyred. But the church is now exercising itself as the body of Christ in the world with its leadership. And what its leadership? And the leadership is definitely St. Paul. I mean, excuse me, it chimes through me out. It's St. Peter. But you can't separate Peter from the body of your church which are the other apostles, and I think especially St. Paul. He was, St. Paul is the great intellectual architect of Christianity. He unpacked who and what is Christ. John, in the Gospels, John's writing, is the mystical Christ. He sees it with a different kind of mystical insight. He uses multiple conflicting metaphors, light and darkness, life and death. He flips those back and forth. He's trying to express the inexpressible. Paul hammers out who and what is Jesus. He's the fulfillment of the law. You see? It's in, that's the life of the church. It's the heart of the church. Her fidelity, that's St. Peter. Her brilliance, that's St. Paul. I mean that. Church can't be reduced to one leader other than the leadership of Christ himself. But all the rest of the church, all the rest of us from the hierarchical level, the papacy, right down to the simplest of all Christians, the most uneducated, as you could say, most whatever, we are all the body of Christ and we all witness to the world. The simplest people witness to the world. You don't have to be the pope or a scholar. You simply have to be a believer. And that's the interesting and the beautiful part of this story. And what makes it really interesting, you'll see it more tomorrow in the Tuesday text, and that's from John, St. John, okay? This one here is St. Matthew, Gospels of Matthew, okay? In John, you'll see tomorrow that in many ways, even here, even in Matthew, the role that women play. It's really, really interesting that women are the first, are the first witnesses to the resurrected Christ. At first, it's the empty tomb. Okay, they are witnesses to the empty tomb. Okay, that's, a, by the way, apparently in the biblical narrative, the New Testament narrative and the early church, it was the, is the empty tomb was a symbol of the resurrected Christ. So the reference to an empty tomb was significant. It wasn't just a graphic detail. It, it reflected the resurrected Christ and therefore the faith in Christ, who and what he is, was and is in the life of the church. It's interesting. The first people who came to the tomb were the women, Mary Magdalene and her sister and whoever, whoever, the other Mary, I don't know. There were women. They came to minister to the dead body of Christ and they found it empty. They found the tomb empty. They were doing what the Jewish law said they were required to do and that turns out to be to cleanse the body of Christ. See, they were fulfilling their obligation in service of Christ. See, that's so interesting. And you'll see 
later on, I think it's sometime this week, either tomorrow or Wednesday, they make apostolic claims. You have to understand that. In the early church, what constituted you an apostle was whether you saw the risen Lord and you had to say so. It isn't the kind of description. It's a statement of, 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 of authenticity. When St. Paul had to say, when he was Saul of Tarsus and he had to say, I'm an apostle, he had to say, I have seen the Lord. It's an expression used by the apostles. I have seen the Lord, and that means after the resurrection. I have seen the Lord. The women of the church say it before the apostles say it. They saw him first. And they come in, and when they come storming into the cenacle where the guys are hiding, okay, <laughs> they're hunkered down. These women are out there in the open. What do they announce? I have seen the Lord. Uh, we'll see it as the week goes on. But let me just share this with you. Just a thought, just a thought. I'm willing to bet that in the very early church, there was no distinction between, a sharp distinction, exclusive, one that would exclude between the women of the church and the apostles because the women were proclaiming the risen Christ. They were apostles. I don't, I would almost, I don't know how to think of the priesthood and the hierarchical structure of the church. Christ establishes that on, on Holy Thursday and he gives the, he um, the, uh, establishes the hierarchical order under the leadership of the Pope, okay, Peter, okay? I'm not gonna, how can I deny it, okay? I don't, know, I don't want to deny it. But yet the women play an apostolic role as well. Maybe they don't share in the priesthood, there's no indication of that. But they, answer, but they proclaim Christ. They are a witness to Christ. And I have to say, historically, the women of the church have been the reformers of the church. Maybe because, honestly, they weren't corrupted by it. In my homily this morning here at St. Mark's, one of the thoughts that I had, it comes so strongly in my mind, and that is the, the, the notion of the church, of Christ, the concept of Christ as a suffering servant, okay, Okay, that should be this, the story as well of the church. She is the servant. She is the suffering servant, okay? She's not the Lord and Master. But I think historically what happened is when she became wedded to the Roman Empire, and especially after its collapse, she was the last vestige of that Roman hier hierarchical structure in the papacy, or in the, in the episcopacy, in the, in the bishops, the clergy. And she was as it were, wedded to that image and that role, and she helped to build a kind of civilization from it. Okay, and you, you can't understand Western Christian, Western culture without understanding the intrinsic role that the church played in it, Judeo-Christianity, as well as Roman law and science, the Greeks, you see? That's the West. But at the same time, that hierarchical structure struck uh, um, that in a sense, that source of power also was a source of corruption. And it was the women of the church who were uncorrupted by the wedding of the church with the Roman structure in the Roman Empire. And weren't corrupted by it because they didn't share in its power. And they're the great reformers. Historically, the women of the church have been the great reformers of the church. And it's just the truth. Because they were never included in and, in, and became part of the will to power. Thank you, Friedrich Nietzsche the will to power. They were always the servant. But in the servant, they were the suffering servant. They were the voice of Christ. They were Christ in the world. I mean that too. The role of women in the church, intrinsically and whatever you want to put it, has been the lifeblood of the church in so many ways. They have been the voice, they have been the voice of the suffering servant as opposed to the magisterial authoritative power. They have held the power to account. I'm thinking of Catherine of Siena, but so many others. Teresa of Avila, holy moly. One of the greatest saints of our time, uh, the, uh, Mother Teresa. Holy Christmas trees. What a witness she is to the world, huh? I mean, we've had great popes during the 20th century, but Teresa's had uh, uh, of Calcutta. Well, God, come on, I'm having a hell of a time, but she is the ultimate witness. Yeah. Anyway, I'm stumbling on my words, and I'm sorry. <laughs>